Hello, everyone. Good evening. I am Meme Omokbarai, the executive director and CEO of CAA. And it's a fabulous joy to have this event here this evening, the first since the pandemic. And I'm seeing so many here in person for the first time in how many years? <laughs> I think we all deserve a hand of applause for being here. <laughs> and for all of you watching this from all over the globe, if it's morning, afternoon, evening, whatever it is, it's a joy to have this event here tonight, the 50th anniversary of feminism and art at CAA. And on behalf of CAA Board of Directors, committees, staff, I am delighted to welcome all of you, no matter how you choose to participate this evening. And for joining us, I gather this is the first live event of this kind here in this booth, Boston University's Joan and Edgar Booth Theater. It is wonderful to do this in so many ways, so many firsts, and so much celebration. The program this evening will ref reflect on the history of feminism at CAA and serve as an opportunity to envision feminism's future within our organization. And that is why I am delighted to say that earlier this week, Dr. Anne Sutherland Harris gave us a first-hand account of the beginning of the Women's Caucus for Art. Dr. Harris was the first president of Women's Caucus for Art, WCA, in 1972, helping to create the foundation for how feminism at CAA and WCA functions today. Dr. Harris's illustrious career resulted in the discovery and systemic identification of several 17th century Italian painters. Now a professor emerita at the University of Pittsburgh's History of Art and Architecture, Dr. Harris received grants and academic support from the Guggenheim and Ford Foundations, NEA, NEH, Metropolitan Museum of Art, and the J. Paul Getty Museum. It is said that when Mrs. Wilhelmina Cole Halliday, a collector of women's art, asked Dr. Harris what she should do with her art collection, Dr. Harris suggested Mrs. Halliday start a museum. That museum became the National Museum of Women in the Arts in Washington, D.C. Now we'll hear from Dr. Harris. First of all, I must thank the CAA and the WCA, that is the College Art Association and the Women's Caucus for Art, for creating this special tribute that honors the many members of both organizations who make art and love thinking about it and who also challenged the barriers that faced women in our professions 50 years ago. We've managed over these years to make our part of the academic world in America much more hospitable to women. I was not a precocious feminist. Even when I first met the glass ceiling, a term not yet in use, at Columbia University in 1968, I was only dimly aware of the degree to which professional women faced barriers in America and I know in, in Great Britain too. 
I joined a group named Columbia Women's Liberation that emerged from the Vietnam War protests and civil rights activism of 1968 and onwards. I read Kate Millett's Sexual Politics and met her and some of her friends. I helped to research and write up statistics that proved that was evident to anyone who checked the ratios of men to women at Columbia University, namely that Columbia University's hiring practices discriminated against women and had for years. We could only find three tenured women among the hundreds of Columbia faculty. This is certainly true for the other famous private universities, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Brown, etc., and was a situation only partially mitigated by the founding of women's colleges, such as Barnard, Wellesley, and Smith. And then I just need to tell you that I'm going to talk about somebody who's not an art historian or an artist, uh, but who uh, found a way uh, to make uh, American universities take women not just seriously, but as equal colleagues in our professions. Bernie Sandler realized that an executive order of President Johnson issued in 1964 that forbade discrimination on the basis of religion, race, and sex by recipients of federal funding could be applied to major research universities, which of course received millions of dollars of federal funding. What Bernie Sandler needed was proof that available pools of qualified women existed, because you can't claim that they're discriminating against women if there aren't any women with PhDs ready to teach in these uh, institutions. What Bernie Sander needed was proof that available pools of qualified women existed. Our report to the University Senate presented abundant evidence that there were many women with PhDs in subjects taught at Columbia. We also sent our report to newspapers and it made the Sunday New York Times. We soon heard from other women who were collecting similar evidence from other universities, at other universities. Our mimeograph paper was read into the congressional record, published in the AUP bulletin, and so on. I even went down to Washington and testified before a congressional group. You know, I did not have an American, uh, I was an American citizen then. And they seemed uh, perfectly happy <laughs> to hear what I had to say. The result was that millions of federal grant money was held up until Columbia and similar institutions showed evidence of awareness of discrimination against women and convincing plans to hire women in numbers that reflected the available talent. Columbia had to wait a bit to get $33 million. I guess they eventually got it. Bernie Sandler eventually sued 250 American universities and forced them to change their ways. I believe that no one has done more to make the academic world more hospitable to women than she did. Please look up her obituaries and also try to read Rosalind Rosenberg's book, Changing the Subject, How the Women of Columbia Shaped the Way We Think About Sex and Politics. It was published back in 2004. Beautifully written. You will enjoy reading every word. Academe is indeed more hospitable to women now than it was in that almost distant past. Both Harvard and Princeton have had women presidents and maybe others have too. Pittsburgh University, however, is yet to have a woman chancellor and hardly ever had a woman give the address to the graduating undergraduate class, the majority of whom these days are women. We are not finished yet. My participation in Columbia Women's Liberation gave me a reputation as a feminist activist. It was not always a good thing when I was looking for jobs. I helped to start the WCA with the help of many other women attending CAA in San Francisco in 1971, or possibly 72. There was a group from San Francisco who organized a meeting by posting flyers around the hotel where we were meeting and so many women came that we needed an additional room to accommodate everyone. I agreed to be the first president of the Women's Caucus for Art, I suppose because of what I'd been doing with, at Columbia. I went home with around $300 and a list of names and addresses of several hundred women. It all fitted into one desk drawer. 
I began the process then of creating the structures for this infant organization that many others with better skills in this specialty than I have, have since perfected. Two years later, two large cartons of relevant material made the trip to Washington, D.C., where Mary Garrard took over. And I hope that's a familiar name from her wonderful books on Artemisia Gentileschi and other subjects about women in art. I cannot remember much about my two years, except that some of those who donated did not think they were getting their money's worth. And I had to agree. And now I hope they do uh, find that their, um, that their donations of any kind are, are, are well spent. Looking through the Women Cau Women's Caucus for Art beautifully designed book celebrating our 50th anniversary and the 41st group of Lifetime Achievement Awards, I've learned that there are lively WCA chapters in many major cities and less famous towns whose members have found a variety of ways to support each other and expand the places where their works can be seen um, or even become permanent monuments in gardens and parks. And I also like the new name, the National Women's Corps for Art. It's flourishing all over the United States. I need to check up on the Berkeley chapters because that's where my, my son and his family live and I expect to uh, be there for Christmas. I don't think the College Art Association should get off scot free for its past sins, since it's the main professional organization for art historians and artists who teach in colleges and universities. It had to clean up its act too, electing its first president around then, and many more since, and electing more women to its board, more sessions led by women, etc., and making sure hiring practices at its conventions were professional and fair. And you could write a, a very interesting part, partly amusing and partly just to make you boil with anger about the kind of questions asked women uh, in those situations. A couple of Women's Caucus for Art presidents have also been presidents of the CAA. And now we have at last the CAA's first executive director and CEO, who is a woman of color, Mimi Amogbach. And another woman, Jennifer Rissler, I assume she's Dr. Professor Jennifer Rissler, as president of the CAA board. The future looks good. And finally, thank you for coming to this special event. I wish you all the very best in your many futures. As you can see, um, we all owe a debt of gratitude to Dr. Harris for her leadership in the field and countless contributions to CAA and WCA. And now I would like to introduce Dr. Jennifer Reisler, who she referenced, uh, the current president of CAA, before becoming president this past May, uh, Dr. Riesler served as CAA's VP for External Relations and as chair for the Committee of, on Women in the Arts. Previously, she served as VP and um, several roles within CAA and currently Dean Emerita at the San Francisco Art Institute. She also was a co-president of Art Table, one of the partners of this event. And so without further ado, it gives me huge pleasure to introduce my co-host, and your new board president of CAA, Jennifer. Thank you, Mei Mei. As she mentioned, I am a past president of Art Table and also a chair emerita of the CAA Committee on Women in the Arts, and so today's event holds deeply personal significance for me, and I'm very delighted to be here in person. This evening's historic event, which is both live and being live streamed across the globe to hundreds of viewers, would not have happened without the hard work by many individuals, 
starting with our visionary leader, Executive Director Meme Omogbai, whose plan for CAA's future actively builds upon the foundation of the organization's feminist tradition. I would also like to thank our host this evening, Boston University School of Visual Arts, and specifically CAA's Vice President for Committees, Lynn Allen, for helping coordinate this beautiful location. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you also to CAA Chief of Staff, Megan Donahue, for her tireless work producing this event, and CAA's Development Committee for their support, and in particular, Chair Katie Rogers, who is here this evening. I send a sincere thank you to our streaming partners, Art Table, Women and Their Work, and Pen and Brush, and CAA's Vice President for External Relations, Shahrazad Garcia Vasquez, for helping to coordinate two of our streaming partners this evening. I thank the CAA Feminism 50 Honorary Committee for helping to make this event possible, all of the dedicated CAA members who donated time and money to make this event possible, the Women's Caucus for Art, the Feminist Art Project, for being in the trenches with CAA all of these years to ensure that the work and visibility of women in the arts is present. And all of the CAA and Women's Caucus for Art feminist pioneers, without whom my presidency and those of others would not be possible. Speaking of feminist pioneers, I find it very serendipitous this evening that I follow the formidable Anne Sutherland Harris. Years ago, while I was researching the groundbreaking feminist art program in the archives of the California Institute of the Arts or CalArts, a program which was founded by our colleagues Judy Shapiro, excuse me, Judy Chicago and Miriam Shapiro, feminist trailblazers in their own right. I uncovered a copy of a progress report to artist members of the CAA, CAA Women's Caucus written by Anne 50 years ago in 1972. On the margin of the first page of the four page document, Anne had handwritten a note to Miriam which read, Miriam, information only. You've done so much for women that I don't expect you to fill these in. Humor aside, Anne's note belies, in my mind, the sheer amount of hard work taken to generate not only the progress report, but the accompanying survey of art history and studio departments. Of note is the reference to CAA as the only organization willing to pay for a proper survey, which Anne so deftly indicated was a necessary precedent, precedent to any concerted efforts to improve the situation of women in the visual arts professions in America. This came after the CAA Committee on the Status of Women had exhausted its attempts to identify every plausible looking foundation for underwriting with no success. The work involved in asking members of the Women's Caucus to make copies of the questionnaire, whether by retyping with carbons or by Xeroxing them, to capture 750 institutions across this country is profound. Grassroots, both by necessity and by the historical moment, what was sought was real, lived, and legitimate feedback on how, by being women, we were met with what late, the late Marilyn Loden termed a glass ceiling. What this anecdote illustrates is the long-standing commitment by CAA to advance women and women-identifying scholars and art and design practitioners. The seven questions written within the survey still resonate with us today, 50 years later, including, has your sex and or marital status handicapped your professional career? Do you know of other women in our professions who have been handicapped by their sex and or by their marital status? When being interviewed for a job, have your interviewees stated openly that they would prefer a man or that women are less capable for any reason of doing the job in question or in any other way openly displayed prejudice against hiring women. Although these questions still hold an uncanny resonance 50 years later, in particular against the current cultural climate of eroding women's rights, Anne and those involved in this early advocacy efforts at CAA 
should be commended, and I thank her. Their legacy has lived on through the hard work and dedication of countless CAA members, past presidents, executive directors, board members, and affiliated societies. This evening, we reaffirm our commitment to advance the recognition, promotion, scholarship, and art of women and women-identifying peers. Along those lines, I'm delighted to report that the CAA Executive Committee on behalf of the Board of Directors, in recognition and celebration of the golden anniversary of feminism and art at CAA, issued a historic proclamation for both a distinguished posthumous as well as a living award to be given as part of this evening's program. This serves as a crescendo to the year-long celebration of this 50th anniversary, which commenced on November 4th, 2021. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Joanna Gardner-Huggett, current chair of CAA's Committee on Women in the Arts and member of this event's honorary committee, who will present these awards. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. As chair of Committee on Women in the Arts, or CWA, it is a great honor to be here to present the Distinguished Feminist Artist and Distinguished Feminist Scholar Award at CAA's 50th anniversary of feminism. I'm grateful to Meme Omogbai, Executive Director and CEO of CAA, Lindy Allen, Vice President of CAA Committees, the 50th Anniversary Honorary Committee, and major thanks for the tireless coordination of this event by Megan Donahue, Chief of Staff, Strategic Planning, Diversity, and Governance. And hopefully I'll get this right with the slides. Okay. CAA presents two annual Distinguished Feminist Awards each year. One presented to a visual artist or designer who through outstanding efforts in their practice or advocacy has advanced the cause of equality for women in the arts. One presented to a scholar who through outstanding efforts in their scholarship, curatorial practice or advocacy has advanced the cause of equality for women in the arts. In honor of the feminist anniversary, allow me a moment to give a brief history of the award. In 1996, the CWA established the Award for Distinction, and in 2007, it became the CAA Distinguished Feminist Award under the chairmanship of Midori Yoshimoto and a proposal initiated by Diane Burko with support for Frema Fox Hofrichter. From that point on, an outside jury has determined the awards. In 2017, CAA board the CAA board approved a resolution proposed by the CWA under the leadership of Donna Moran to expand the award to honor both a distinguished feminist artist and distinguished feminist scholar. As you scan the list of past awardees, you see the amazing array of feminist artists, curators, critics, and scholars who have established a powerful foundation for transformation of the art world, art history, and art activism. Before offering tributes to our awardees, I would like to extend my sincere thanks to the Distinguished Feminist Award Jury, Delinda J. Collier, Robin Cass, and Midori Yoshimoto, as well as Paul Skiff at CAA for handling the logistics of the awards. In addition, I want to acknowledge the significant work of our committee members, who spent considerable time preparing dossiers for nominations, specifically Liz Kim, Vanessa Parent, Monica Fabajanska, Kimberly Lamb, and Andrew Hoddle. As we celebrate this 50th anniversary of feminism, it is essential to recognize the urgency of sustaining feminist art, scholarship, and activist practices as we emerge from a pandemic where women were disproportionately impacted, exposed continued systemic and structural racism, and rapidly accelerating climate change and the grave moment when Roe versus Wade was overturned this past June, just shy of its own 50th anniversary. Our awardees this evening embody the decolonial, transnational, and intersectional feminisms so crucial to moving forward. First, we honor Yolanda Lopez for the Distinguished Feminist Artist Award. As many of you know, Lopez sadly passed away last year just as the CWA submitted our nomination. 
It is with great sadness that we are not able to present her this award personally, but grateful that her son, Rio Yanez, has accepted the award on her behalf. We will hear from him soon. The CWA offers its most sincere thanks to Amalia Mesa Baines, Karen Mary Davalos, Maria Elena Busek, Cecilia Fajardo Hill, and Jill Dozzi for their endorsements and support of our nomination that greatly helped shape our tribute this evening. The CWA nominated Lopez at a pivotal moment in her five decade career, where her integral role in feminist and Latinx communities was being recognized. In October 2021, the Museum of Contemporary Art San Diego opened Yolanda Lopez's Portrait of the Artist, the first solo museum retrospective exhibition for Lopez, curated by Jill Dawsey and accompanied by a catalog with new scholarship. In addition, Lopez was named a Latin Art, Latinx Artist Fellow by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Jessica Sabogal included the representation of Lopez's image in 1984 Walking Vergen artwork in her 60 foot high mural on the new affordable housing building erected by the Mission Economic Development Agency in San Francisco's Mission District, which testifies to the artist's political activism in the neighborhood's historically working class, mostly Latinx population. Lopez's feminist sensibility as an artist is located at the origins of third wave feminism. When Chicana feminists during this time fought multiple fronts, racist and imperialist institutions in the United States, exclusion by white feminists, and at home the patriarchal structures of Mexican American cultures and society. Lopez engaged in this fight providing visual ammunition for her fellow feminists of color. The artist's reimagining of the Lady of Guadalupe as herself, an artist and as her mother and her grandmother, are works that deconstructed existing symbols of Mexican American culture and reclaimed Mexican American women's subjectivity and ownership of its ideologies. These works by Lopez, among her others, manifest Mexican American women as an integral part of the American fabric during a time when representation of a multicultural United States was being debated and reformulated. Lopez also made contributions through her writing, such as the essay Social Protest, Racism, and Sexism, co-written with art historian Maura Roth for the 1994 anthology The Power of Feminist Art, The American Movement of the 1970s, History and Impact where she challenged the history of privileging Euro-American feminist artists and demanded that we tackle questions of race, privilege, and racism in art history. Further, Lopez should be acknowledged for her role as a teacher and mentor to generations of students at her alma mater, University of California, San Diego, as well as the University of California, Berkeley, Mills College, Stanford University, and as director of education at San Francisco's Mission Cultural Center for Latino Arts. Honoring Lopez with the Distinguished Feminist Artist Award not only affirms her contributions as an important American artist, but also prompts a re-examination of the exclusion of Chicana Chicano art as ethnic art, remixing and appropriation in the complex racial and ethnic composition and power relations within American communities occurred in correspondingly complex ways. Lopez's art over the years exemplify this complexity while providing a grounding and a recuperation of a more diverse landscape for feminist and American art history. Let's give a warm round of applause for the tremendous legacy of Yolanda Lopez. We are very pleased to present the Distinguished Feminist Scholar Award to Dr. Cecilia Fajardo Hill. The CWA is great, grateful to Connie Butler, Claudia Callerman, and Catherine Morris for their endorsements of our nomination that helped shape our dossier and tribute this evening. Unfortunately, Dr. Fajardo Hill could not attend tonight, but we will hear her video acceptance very soon. Cecilia Fajardo Hill is a British Venezuelan art historian and curator of modern and contemporary art, whose work focuses 
on Latin America with particular emphasis on women as visual artists. Her scholarship and curatorial work are recognized internationally for advocating and prom promoting a nuanced understanding of Latin American art and challenging established hierarchies that embrace only those artists who are easily aligned with canonical styles and movements. The nuance of Fajardo Hill's work is particularly important for Latin American women artists, as their invisibility within global art systems is the result of fixed categorizations as well as entrenched assumptions that women, femininity, and feminism are limited and not worth the cultural value attributed to the artist. In 1990, or excuse me, since 1998, Fajardo Hill has curated more than 40 exhibitions, many of which have foregrounded the work of successful yet underrepresented Latin American women artists, including Deborah Arango, Nadia Benatar, Johanna Calle, Maria Avelio Marmolejo, Amelia Azacarte, and Maria Jose Arjona. Radical Women in 2017 was curated by, co-curated with Andrea Junta um, as a groundbreaking exhibition, Radical Women, Latin American Art, 1960 to 1985, which was organized by the Hammer Museum in Los Angeles and subsequently traveled to the Brooklyn Museum and Pinacoteca de Sao Paulo in 2018. A major curatorial intervention, Radical Women presented the work of 120 women artists and collectives that were active in Latin America and the United States during a crucial period in both Latin American art history and the development of contemporary art. Well-known figures, Lydia Clark, Ana Mendieta, and Marta Minujin were featured, but we were also introduced to a wide array of practices by artists across Latin America who made critically important contributions to the art world, yet remained unknown to many until this exhibition. We should recognize the tremendous commitment and labor required to mount such a show and publish its catalog. For instance, the hundreds of studio visits with her collaborator Andrea Junta and vast archival research. In addition, Fajardo Hill staged a series of roundtables with stakeholders to help develop a fair and inclusive framework for the exhibitions, which further reflects Fajardo Hill's investment in a feminist ethos. It's also appreciated that the Hammer provided a digital archive for radical women, including the exhibition catalog, not only making Fajardo Hill's work and her collaborators very accessible to anyone with access to the web, but this archive will continue to inspire emerging generations of artists, curators, and scholars. The impact of Fajardo Hill's work is recognized by her many affiliations and collaborations with institutions in the United States and Latin America. She has worked as a curator in several organizations, including the Museum of Latin American Art in Los Angeles, where she also served as vice president of curatorial affairs. For more than a decade, she was the director at the Fundacion Eugenio Mendoza in Caracas, Venezuela. Fajardo Hill, has held prestigious visiting scholar positions at the Clark Art Institute, Princeton University, Harvard University, and UCLA Chicano Studies Research in Los Angeles, just to name a few. Overall, Fajardo Hill's career creates paths for curators and art historians to better imagine and realize equitable dialogues between the global north and South, and we look forward to her future and continued groundbreaking endeavors. Let's give Dr. Celia Fajardo-Hill a warm round of applause. And now we will hear from Yolanda Lopez's son, Rio Yanez, and then Dr. Fajardo-Hill. Hello, my name is Rio Yanez. I am the son of Yolanda Lopez, and it is such a great honor to accept this award on her behalf. Uh, over the years, um, my mom has attended CAA and um, has taken me several times, was very influential to both of us in the process of cataloging my mom's archive. It's been really fascinating to see programs uh, from various CAA events 
uh, over the last 20 and 30 years. So um, it's, it is a quite profound moment to be here on her behalf, uh, accepting this award. I've been asked to talk about my mom's work as as a feminist and and kind of what what the through line of that is and I think for me it really starts with representation. Um, my mom recently had the her very first solo show of uh, her illustrative work from the. Uh, 70s and early 80s. And I think what really struck me was just her strong desire for representation. Um, seeing the portraits of the women in her family, her mother, her grandmother, and presenting them as portraits on such a grand scale, uh, signifying that they are uh, relevant and worthy and strong uh, subjects of art. Um, it was such a such a, a beautiful thing uh, to see that work um, on the walls at such a large scale. And really, I think it's her desire to see women like herself, women like her mother, women like her grandmother, uh, represented as art, uh, in art, uh, and truly um, wanting others to to see them as uh, important subjects and women like them as important subjects of art. Um, I think what I would really like to express on my mother's behalf um, are two things that I think she, she took very uh, near and dear. Um, one is to stand by your work. Growing up uh, as, as the son of Yolanda Lopez, I saw firsthand how she advocated for herself um, when no one else would, and how she had to stand up for her work. Uh, dealing with such iconic figures as the Virgin of Guadalupe, uh, as the subject and uh, kind of motif of her art. Um, and in the 80s, uh, compiling uh, and creating these installations of um, stereotypical images of Mexicans and Mexican-Americans. I witnessed my mom being confronted at art openings. I saw my mom cross picket lines of protesters who were there because they were angry about the work she was producing. Um, I've witnessed her getting angry and threatening phone calls, letters, windows of her art exhibits uh, being smashed, uh, death threats. And I think what was really incredible about uh, my mom is how she stood by her work, how she stood by her process, how she advocated for herself and defended herself uh, when no one else would. And it was that strength and resiliency that was really, really inspiring to me um, that she that she stuck with um, what she was doing, stuck with the the artwork that she was creating, her message and um, I've always just been so impressed, um, even in the scariest of moments, with my mom's strength to uh, really advocate for herself. She would always tell me that as an artist, never apologize for your work. Um, and so on her behalf, I ask that uh, none of you ever apologize for your work, that you stand by your work uh, and um you advocate for yourself when no one else can or will. Um, I think my mom's greatest legacy is not her, her artwork. Uh, I truly, truly believe that it is her mentorship. In the last 20, 25 years of her life, my mom has mentored uh, multiple generations of artists, of um, people who have sought her out 
to talk about their own work, to develop their own process. And um, it's been a joy seeing her relationship with so many young artists uh, blossom and how her her mentorship and how her her friendships with these young artists um, have uh, really changed the course of their work and of their lives. Um, so uh, on behalf of Yolanda Lopez, I just, my ask um, would be to continue her, her spirit and her practice of mentorship. I think now more than ever, we are at such a critical time. And I think the idea and the role of mentorship is so important. And it was truly her most important practice. And with that, thank you so much for this award. Um, I am so touched and so honored to accept this on behalf of Yolanda Lopez. Thank you. Hello, I am truly sorry not to be present um, during the CAA to receive the Distinguished Feminist Award for which, for which I am truly very grateful. And um, so my name is Cecilia Fajardo Hill. I'm an art historian and a curator that is um, dedicated to work in modern and contemporary art for Latinx and Latin American art and in general modern and contemporary art. So I would like to, I mean, I, I feel that it's such an honor to receive um, this recognition, especially knowing that um, scholars such as Griselda Polo, Lucy Lippert, Laurie Stokes Sims, Amelia Jones, Linda Nocklin, Amelia Mesa Bain, and Jane Quick to C. Smith have received it too. So thank you very much. In thinking of what feminism or feminism is in the plural may mean, I uh, have been particularly interested in thinking of uh, a Chicana and, um, and Latina feminism in the intersection with hemispheric view with Latin American art and also thinking of it in terms of um, going across sort of race and ethnicity, which then by default implies a dialogue with African-American art, Native American art, and so forth. And I, I feel that this, <laughs> this, this distinguished award that I've been given is, is particularly meaningful because we're in a year in 2022 after the pandemic, during the pandemic, um, 2020 was the 100 years of the of the constitutional right for women to vote, which wasn't really given to all the women in America. But at the same time, it was a huge step ahead. But at the same time, you know, all the celebrations that were planned for that year didn't really take place because of the pandemic. And then at the same time, 2020 saw an enormous spike in violence towards women and children to especially women that had to be locked in their homes in difficult situations. So this for me is very emblematic of where we stand now. You know, feminism is really an ongoing um, quest for women and for men and for trans and for anybody. Feminism is for all of us. And um, here you see in the screen a series of artists, for example, Joseli Carvalho is a Brazilian woman that migrated to the US, Ana Mendieta Cuba that migrated to the US as a child, Cecilia Vicuña, Chilean woman migrated to the to the US as Maribel Marmolejo from, from Colombia, and then you have Judy Baca, Chicana artist, New Yorkan artist Sophie Rivera, and a Chicana artist Delilah Montoya. And at the end of the day, when you establish dialogues and across the board in terms of the human rights and that sort of the experimental quest that they have been, you know, made by feminist women and women and defending the rights of women, then, you know, this geopolitical division doesn't really, uh, it doesn't really work, you know, it's an artificial thing. And here are examples of bibliography that has actually happened that has informed a, a sort of an idea of feminism or feminisms, which is, uh, 
broader than the sort of the traditional historical feminism, you know, including issues that have to do with racism, third world, you know, you know, fem women feminism, and also monographies by artist Lucy Lippert, who also was one of the repository of this fe feminist award of this year some years ago. So, you know, this is an ongoing uh, line of, of effort that has actually been taking place. Again, here you have a coalition of women. You know, I believe very strongly in this notion of the political, the body, this sort of no body politics as much, but this sort of presence and affirmation of a body, a sexuality, and rights. And of course, when we uh, co curated with Andrea Junta Radical Women, if you can see the map, the geopolitical map includes the US and Latin America, and situations of oppression that happen, let's say, in the middle of a dictatorship in Latin America was, you know, a situation that was somehow similar to the one that women were so enduring in, in the U.S., for example, Chicana women being harassed by the police or women that were, you know, sterilized without their consent. Here you have a Brazilian artist, Lenora de Barros, B. Patsy Valdez in Judy Baca, or you have... Uh, Marcia Schwarz from Argentina, Barbara Carrasco talking about red tape in the US. So these dialogues are possible. And you have the presence of women that have been very much absent somehow from this discussion. Someone like Laura Aguilar, who died in 2017. Sally, you know, she talks about this oppression of the body, a body that also is not a conformist body, is a brown body, um, you know, between the, the sort of the, the the ideology, the state ideology of both Mexico and the U.S. So there is an intertwinedness there that is very strong. Someone like Linda Lucero presenting uh, women or someone like Lolita Lebron who fought very hard for the liberation of Puerto Rico from, you know, the U.S. Um, imperial uh, situation and, you know, the presence of indigenous women. So there is a... Um, a diversity in the way that are so many women have included in that conversation that is absolutely necessary to uh, cherish, uh, discuss, study. Well, for example, Maria Magdalena Campos Pons, another uh, Afro-Cuban artist that migrated to the US about the, you know, the whitening of the skin of culture, who you are, your identity, or Barbara Carrasco, again, talking about this issue of, you know, Chicana, that is white, but you know, that the, is again, whitening of culture, whitening of skin, there is a lot of complexity in ethnicity or um, enforced realization. Isabel Castro discussed this, or Esther Hernandez that discussed, you know, the whole issues of use of pesticide in the fields for all the, you know, Chica Chicanex, you know, Chicanos that worked in the fields in the US. Or Yolanda Lope, who died sadly very recently, talking about this intersection of rel religiosity and femininity in the Virgen de Guadalupe, and also in, in ideas such as the Venus de Botticelli. Um, Esther Hernandez, you know, talking about the Virgen de Guadalupe, that the fans, and then, you know, the idea of a stage statue of liberty that also includes a double identity that has to do with Mexico, particularly. Or, for example, more recently, Sandy Rodriguez discussing the issue of what happened with uh, children's separation in the border. You know, this Maria and Jasmine, you know, the baby had died in the hands of the ICA. And again, reclaiming also a sense of, of territoriality because that area used to be in Mexico, used to be in Aguatl. Or Esther Hernandez, you know, identifying with the situation of the disappeared during the dictatorship in Chile that was greatly, you know, um, given by the fact that the, the U.S. intervened and Allende was assassinated. Malia Mesa Bain, another incredible artist, scholar, and curator, a Chicana, who has created theorizations around the notion of the of Mexicana, who received, again, a, a Distinguished Feminist Award by the CAA some years ago, creating a different notion of, you know, intersection between altarity, you know, spirituality and... and and the idea of intimacy of the home and paying homage to a type of lineage of women that normally is not present. And here are more, uh, you know, it's sort of contemporary and and, and more, you know, um, pieces like from the 90s or from 2018, like Martin Gutierrez, a trans um, Latina working on, you know, rethinking of notions of indigeneity, 
again, Yolanda Lopez, so what part am I Indian, you know, by Celia Rodriguez, talking again about, about uh, notions of, of uh, mixed identity, Fidele Bay is Dominican, and then you have Dominique de Rezo, is of Haitian um, descent, you know, the islands with, that were colonized by different notions, or Juana Valdez of uh, Cuban origin, talking about the color of the skin, and um, again, here you have this idea of, for me, feminism, um, you know, there are different aspects to it. I mean, Lucy Lippert used to discuss it in terms of uh, the support, the recognition of another woman. And I think a feminism very much has this role in mind, the creation of a community, the creation of a visibility and a justice towards women and also women who normally have been excluded from a feminist uh, lineage uh, in the US and everywhere in the world, you know, like Laura Gilad, Plosh Pony, you know, talking about, you know, a lesbian community in LA or Christina Fernandez, who's now has um, opening a wonderful retrospective in Riverside or, you know, a young Chicana, issues of migration, um, and um, Alice Bach, for example, singing White Justice, also dispelling a little bit this notion that, you know, uh, art is just one defined media. And this is one of my latest projects. The images before that I showed that related to a project that I'm co-curating with Marisa del Toro and Gilbert Vicario, which has to do with Chicanx art. And this one is Patsy Valdez, is a project that I am I'm doing at the moment writing and an exhibition of a wonderful Chicana artist that contributed a lot to the ASCO community and again created in all of her photographic images that were profoundly experimental. This idea of solidarity and beauty in bodies that normally are marginalized by society. So it's a type of um, empathy and affectivity that we need profoundly. We need to look back to these notions and being a feminist, being creating a community when you are marginalized is something extremely powerful and difficult. And in my work as a as historian, as a curator, I truly want to continue to work hard to tell the stories, the feminist stories, the stories of women, trans women, brown women, and indigenous women that have produced incredible art, that have been activists and that have been profoundly change the art and the society in which we live in. It's really time for us to acknowledge them and recognize them. So my invitation um, is truly for us to open our eyes and embrace a really broader idea of feminisms that is diverse, that includes many voices, many bodies, many forms of art. I am also delighted that Yolanda Lopez is receiving an, um, an award this year. I admire her so profoundly and, um, and she was a pioneer of sort of a form of agency and politics that was feminist and was activist that, that I feel that it embodies very much uh, the type of work that we want to explore, that we want to actually um, let people understand that it exists because, you know, for artists that are struggling today in a society like the one we have, now that we have Wade and Roe basically fall into pieces, we need for them to understand that there are these pioneers that fought from their body, from, from their ethnicity, from their race, specific race, from specific situations of marginalization and they produce brilliant art, they produce brilliant ideas that today that are truly important references for us as women, as human beings, as feminists uh, in this day and age. So thank you very much. Bravo. I am truly honored. Uh, to be standing on shoulders of women like those. And so um, thank you to Rio uh, Yanez for accepting the Distinguished Feminist Award on behalf of your mother, Yolanda Lopez. Her work as an artist was truly revolutionary.
And thank you to um, Dr. Fahad Hill for your work as a curator, art historian, and for your contributions to CAA and to the visual arts field. Finally, I would like to thank Dr. Gardner Hoggett for serving on the honorary committee for the event and for serving as chair of the Committee of Women in the Arts for the last few years. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Gardner Hoggett embodies the direction we want to go in as an organization in terms of equity, dedicating her time and personal resources to ensuring access to and diversity on her committee. Thank you very much. I truly appreciate that. We will miss you when your term ends in February. Um, again, much gratitude to all of us. And now I'm honored to introduce the next two speakers, feminist pioneers central to the movement and largely responsible for why we are here today. Judith K. Brodsky. Judy needs no introduction. <laughs> but I am delighted that Judy is here today. Judy, the indefatigable artist, curator, author, I could go on and on and on and on. Professor Emerita at Rutgers University's Department of Visual Arts. She is also a distinguished printmaker and the founder and first director of the Rodgers Center for Innovative Print and Paper, later renamed the Broski Center in her honor. Judy was president of CAA from 1994 to 1996, and is also a past president of Art Table and WCA. And this is why you hear me say, she needs no introduction. And no matter how much I try to describe her accomplishments, I could never do it justice anyway. And I am delighted also that Ferris Erling, also at Rutgers in their Department of Art History, is director of Rutgers Institute for Women and Art. She is the recipient of the National Women's Caucus for Art 2012 Lifetime Achievement Award and the Princeton YWCA Tribute to Women's Award. Judith and Dr. Erling co-founded the Center for Women in the Arts and Humanities at Rutgers. And I'm delighted that both women are on the honorary committee for tonight's event. We are so pleased to have them here today to honor generations of feminists at CAA, Judy and Ferris. Thank you so much, Meme, for that lovely introduction. From a personal perspective, Ferris and I are so pleased to be here today to honor the groups of feminist women who over the generations have transformed the College Art Association into a diverse organization conscious of its responsibility to represent all of its diverse membership. Through their activities at CAA, they also did so much to help restructure the fields of art history and the visual arts for the 21st century. And we are thrilled that this occasion is being held to mark 50 years of feminism at the CAA. The CAA is our professional organization. It has nurtured us in our careers. We have presented our ideals in session after session over the last 50 years of CAA conferences. And we have achieved impact on our fields through publishing in CAA's journals, the Art Bulletin, the Art Journal, CAA Reviews, and the CAA Newsletter. But we have also nurtured CAA. 
By 1972, the year when so many feminist organizations were founded and feminist art historians and artists began to emerge, the College Art Association membership was already 50% women. But women made up less than 3% of art and art history faculties, as you were hearing from Anne Sutherland Harris. Not for lack of qualified candidates, 50% of the PhDs in art history were already being granted to women, and almost 50% of Master of Fine Arts degrees. Women were on the move, however, to change the situation, as we heard from Anne Sutherland Harris. Miriam Shapiro, Anne Harris, Mary Garrard, Norma Browdy, Diane Burko, and an overflow crowd of women met in San Francisco at the CAA annual conference and founded the Women's Caucus for Art. Their first effort was a survey that confirmed the discrimination against women in hiring practices. And they went on from there to transform CAA and the art world into the field of diversity that honored the principles of social justice. Uh, we, both Ferris and I, have been in the midst of feminism at CAA since then. We are thrilled today to be the speakers who will be honoring the women who achieved this momentous change and brought us into a new era when we can honor all identifying as women of various sexual orientation, color, and ethnicity. We have organized our ceremony to honor four groups. We want to first to honor those feminist pioneers who are still living. We will then go on to remember those who are deceased, followed by honoring second generations of feminists, and finally, emerging feminists. We will be showing you four PowerPoints documenting some of the women in each group. We've been collecting names with the help of the organizing committee. We know these presentations are not complete, and we hope that those of you who are watching will let CAA know additional names that can be added to these honor lists. But we've done the best we could. Having been involved 50 years and remaining involved today, we were in a position to know many of these women, both the old and the young. It has been a bittersweet voyage for us to organize the day today. We miss those who are gone, and we welcome those who continue to develop a feminist perspective, which is a human perspective in the global culture of today. We thought we knew how much these women had achieved, but we were astonished ourselves at the breadth and impact of their achievements. We know you will be too. Our first group are those pioneers still living. With all that these feminist pioneers have done in their fields, their connection to the College Art Association was also of great importance to them. The CAA, as their professional organization, was an organization that they felt could become a force for social justice in the art world, and they worked hard to make that happen. We, Judy Brodsky and Ferris Olin, are good examples. Judy came to the board in 1986, that watershed moment when Susan Ball became executive director and Linda Nochlin was chair of the nominating committee. It was the first board of feminists and people of color. Phyllis Bober was on the board, joining Irene Winter along with Judy Brodsky. We wrote CAA's first strategic plan, which provided a map for developing the organization to be inclusive and diverse. I eventually became president of the board, as Mamie has mentioned, and in the 1990s, Ferris was elected to the board and became a vice president of the board. We were authors, along with Mary Garrard, of the chapter on diversity in the book published on the occasion of the 100th anniversary of CAA, The Eye, The Hand, The Mind. As you already heard from Anne Southern and Harris, then just a young art history instructor, she took on the responsibility of presiding over the birth of Women's Caucus for Art. Leslie King Hammond, always an advocate for people of color, has also been equally strong advocate for women. Mary Garrard became the second president of the WCA. The WCA was very much a part of the CAA in the early days, but during Mary's tenure, the CAA board, which was still conservative, decided that it would no longer umbrella the WCA, and Mary took it through the steps of becoming a separate nonprofit art organization. 
When Judy became president of the WCA as the first artist to do so, the WCA leaders and the feminist members of the board, like Mary, met before CAA board members in Miriam Shapiro's Tribeca studio and plotted how to introduce resolutions to bring women's equality to CAA. Mary and Norma Browdy and others, like Mae Stevens, would then proceed to bring feminist issues to the board with successes. Women members, as a result of their actions, were granted insurance coverage for pregnancy. The CAA agreed to push for equal pension payments to women and men, rather than less to women. The rules for certain CAA awards were changed to accommodate the timeline of women's lives. The placement bureau would no longer look the other way when men interviewing women opportuned them. So many feminist leaders were on the CAA board at various times, among them Pat Hills, who pioneered feminist monographs on artists like Alice Neal, Howard Dina Pindell, who actually been elected to the board in the 1960s, Faith Ringold, who served as a vice president for people of color for the Women's Caucus for Art. Frima Fox Hofrichter, who became one of the authors of Janssen's History of Art, the book that was the bete noir of those feminist pioneers. Janssen having declared that no women artists were worthy of a book if being in his book. Harmony Hammond and Catherine Lord carried the fight for gender diversity to the board. Griselda Pollock and Hilary Robinson brought their British perspectives on feminism to the United States through talks at CAA conferences. The feminist CAA members in Boston founded the WCA chapter here mm -hmm. and, ended, and ended up as a chapter in Karen Frostig's wonderful book on femi feminist initiatives initiatives blaze. We wish we could talk about all of them, but time will not allow. So we want to finish with a toast, and it will be a virtual toast, to the feisty women who initiated the search for equality, diversity, and inclusivity in creating art, in writing the history of art, and in the College Art Association. They are still contributing. That's, that's the next one. The second group we, we are honoring today are the pioneers who are no longer with us. We have to lead off with Linda Nochlin, whose article, Why Have There Been No Great Women Artists, launched the art historical feminist movement, and Miriam Shapiro, who with Judy Chicago founded the feminist art program at Cal Arts, and organized one of, or possibly the very first, feminist session at a CAA conference in the early 1970s. Both served on CAA committees and the board, and were honored by CAA for their pioneer feminism. Then there were the Californians, Deborah Morrow, the president of the Getty Foundation, who started out as a feminist art historian and always acted in her role as a funder out of principles of social justice she adopted as a young woman. Eleanor Dickinson, who made collecting the statistics that showed advance, or often regression as well, in how women were achieving recognition for their professional contributions. Samela Lewis, multi-talented artist, art historian, curator, publisher, one of the first to document contemporary African-American artists and to make the study of African art an art history discipline rather than an anthropological one, M.R. Roth, who made performance an official art discipline. Archaeologist Sheila McNally took time away from her digs to take on chair of the Committee on the Status of Women after Anne Harris and Linda Nochlin. Mae Stevens, whose paintings of women ran the gamut from Marxist to firebrand heroines like Rosa Luxemburg to her own Irish immigrant mother, and who satirized the officialdom of men, the fire chiefs, police chiefs, politicians, in her Big Daddy series, served on the board. Jacqueline Klipshan, who despite her small physical size, played a giant role in recognition of artists with disabilities. Thalia Guna Peterson, who introduced the concept of second generation feminism in her revolutionary art bulletin article written with her collaborator, Patricia Matthews. The indomitable Cynthia Navaretta, 
always present in the books and journals exhibition area, founder of the Women Artist Newsletter, publisher and activist, Charlotte Robinson, quilter and organizer of one of the first quilt exhibitions which helped make quilting an art medium, had the connection that resulted in the first WCA Awards for Lifetime Achievement taking place at the White House. And then there were a slew of writers. Eleanor Tufts, who wrote one of the first histories of women artists. Marilyn Stokestead, who wrote the first art history survey based on the principles of social justice. The extraordinary Arlene Raven, founder of the Women's Building, the Feminist Studio Workshop, and the feminist art journal Chrysalis. Ellen Lanyon, Chicago-based printmaker and painter, served on the board. And the eminent printmaker and entrepreneur June Wayne was a convocation speaker. Sculptor Dorothy Gillespie organized one of the first feminist centers in New York, the Women's Inter-Art Inter Center. And artist Mary Beth Edelson celebrated the feminist goddess through using her own body as canvas. And Enma Amos celebrated the black body in colorful paintings and prints. We want to honor these women with a moment of silence in which we think about all they did that laid the groundwork for today, a toast and brief moment of meditative remembrance. Our next presentation highlights the CAA artists, art historians, and curators who continue to forge new paths and create new paradigms of feminism based on the concepts of the pioneers, but looking to the present and the future. They have helped to make CAA recognized as a source for the leading edge scholarship that has revolutionized the way art history and visual art criticism are written about and taught. We only have time to mention a few. Some have worked as curators at major national museums and are recognized for exhibitions reflecting on the many decades of feminist art, art history, and theory. One is Connie Butler, who as she was planning her groundbreaking exhibition, WAC, uh, Art and Feminist Revolution, tested her ideas in a session at the CAA annual conference. The same year that WAC opened, Global Feminism opened at the Brooklyn Museum, co-curated by CAA's Linda Nochlin and Maura Riley, the first director of the Center for Feminist Art. She was succeeded in Brooklyn by Catherine Morris, who has presented the CAA in CAA sessions and hosted CAA conference attendees at the Feminist Center. Scholar Professor Joanna gardner Huguet who has restored the history of Chicago-based women artists collectives, Artemisia and ARC, currently heads the CAA Committee on Women in the Arts, and we've just seen her. Maria Elena Busek has frequently presented her research and organized sessions at annual conferences, including the memorial session for Marilyn Stokesed, and has served on the Committee on Women in the Arts. The MacArthur Fellow, Nicole Fleetwood was recognized by CAA with awards of distinction in art history and art criticism in 2021, receiving both the Charles Rufus Morey and the Frank Jewett Mather Awards for the book accompanying her exhibition on art and the incarcerated society. Anne Swartz has served on many CAA committees, including the Intellectual Property Committee and the Committee on Women in the Arts organized several years of TFAP at CAA meetings, as well as having organized many years of the Women's Caucus for Art Lifetime Achievement Awards. She's a pioneer in virtual teaching and a key scholar on the pattern and decoration movement and the work of LBGTQ artists. And Midori Yoshimoto, uh, who has augmented our knowledge of modern and contemporary arts from Japan, has shared this information at many CAA conferences, and as we've already heard, is, has been a chair and member of the Committee on Women in the Arts. Tatiana Flores, an expert on Latin American and Caribbean contemporary art, was editor of the Art Journal and organized several TFAP at CAA symposia. Lisa Farrington specializes in race and gender and visual culture, African American art, and modern art. She now is Associate Dean of Fine Arts at Howard University. 
CAA sessions have been one of the most important vehicles by which feminist visual arts theory has developed and spread, thanks to the effort of individuals such as Mira Shore and Kate, Katie Deepwell, both of whom off, were often at CAA conferences. They founded and published highly respected journals for decades, Shore's Meaning and Deepwell's N Paradoxa, an international feminist art journal. Scholar critic, curator, journalist Aruna D'Azouza has shared her work at annual conferences at CAA and TFAP sessions on intersectional feminism and how museums shape our views of each other and the world. She curated the retrospective of WCA's honoree for lifetime achievement, Lorraine O'Grady, now traveling throughout the United States. Feminist artists continue to contribute their expertise and advice to CAA's board. Internationally known printmaker, Lynn Allen, our host here today, uh, is, is currently, as you've already heard, CAA vice president for committees. Performance artist, Coca Fusco served on the board at the same time as Ferris Olin, and multimedia artist Melissa Potter was the immediate past vice president for conferences. Artist administrator Connie Tell is the driving force behind more than a decade of TFAP at CAA Day of Panels that provide visibility for cutting edge work and thought about feminist art. Conference sessions at which Magdalena Campos Pons participates are always standing room only. Her work interrogates gender, race, nation, and colonialism through video, photography, sculpture, and performance. We raise our virtual champagne glasses to toast these incredible feminists. Our final category celebrates emerging feminist visual arts professionals who, despite the fact that they are still at the beginning of their careers, are already making their mark at the CAA and in the art world. Artist Laura Morrison, longtime CAA member, is the immediate past president of the Women's Caucus for Art. Metropolitan Museum of Art curator of 19th and 20th century art, Denise Morell, presented her thinking behind her groundbreaking exhibition, Posting Modernity, the Black Model from Monet, oh, from Manet, excuse me, and Matisse to Today at the CAA conference held just before her exhibition opened in Paris at the Musée d'Orsay. Kathleen Wintrex, CAA sessions on women artists collectives and collaborations will soon yield a publication. She organized a digital exhibition for the Feminist Institute focused on Mary Beth Adelson and her studio practice. Audrey Chan, who is an organizer of a, T, of a TFAP day, does research-based public projects to challenge dominant historical narratives through allegories of power, place, and identity. Maria Hupfield is a transdisciplinary performance artist who creates objects to use in her performances, as many of us witnessed during a recent annual conference. Arts entrepreneur and curator Jasmine Wall converted empty urban spaces into galleries. Her work has been so impactful that she was named the inaugural Holly Black Social Justice Curator at the Bronx Museum of Art. Block was a feminist uh, pioneer curator and a museum director. Sampada Aranka is the recipient of the 2021 Art Journal Award for her article, Blackouts and Other Visual Escapes. Her research interests include performance theories of embodiment, visual culture, and black cultural and aesthetic theory. Art historian Elisa Eidelman's research explores the recuperation of transnational narratives on gender and feminism in modern and contemporary art. She has regularly participated in conference sessions, and now she holds the position of co-editor-in-chief for Women's Art Journal, which is always a center of attention at the annual CAA conference book exhibits. CAA members continue to reshape the fields of art history and the visual arts to halt erasure of the contributions of women and non-whites. They do so from positions of authority and influence. Curator Michelle Miller Fisher is based here at the Boston MFA, where she is curator of contemporary decorative arts. Art historian Jessica Horton focuses on modern and contemporary art specializing in Native American politics, globalization, and environmental justice. Eva Diaz's, Diaz, sorry, Diaz, 
teaching and scholarship are informed by historical and contemporary interdisciplinary collaborations between artists and other cultural producers. We salute these emerging feminists and we look forward to learning more about their accomplishments. As we mentioned at the beginning of these presentations, we could only include a few of those who should be recognized. Our lists are missing so many who have made and are making contributions to contemporary feminism in the art world. We need your help to make our documentation more complete. We urge you to please contact CAA to, name, to add your name or the name of a colleague to the list. Much work has been done and yet there is so much more to be accomplished. From a personal perspective, both of us have thrived professionally over decades from our collaboration with CAA. We look forward to watching our colleagues and CAA continue to work hand in hand as a force for social justice in the world of art. Thank, Thank you. you. Let's hear it again for Judy and Ferris. Thank you so very much. Um, they are trailblazing contributions cannot be overstated, and we are truly grateful. Thank you again. And now I am thrilled to introduce our keynote speaker, Leslie King. Hammond. Leslie is a force of nature. Those of you who know her know that. But you will see today why she is a force of nature. She is a Renaissance woman, a scholar, an artist, pioneer, an advocate in the arts and feminism movement. She is the graduate dean emerita and founding director of the Center for Race and Culture at Maryland Institute College for Art, MICA. Dr. King Hammond is the curator of multiple exhibitions and the recipient of several grants and fellowships including the Crest Fellowship in 1974 and three Mellon grants for faculty research. She serves on the board of directors at the original F. Lewis Museum of Maryland African American History and Culture. She was also a senior fellow at the Robert W. Deutsch Foundation Dr. King Hammond continues to leave a legacy of assisting the next generation of scholars and artists. And I hope you all hear a resonating and recurring theme today, mentorship. Extending the hand of help to the next generation. That's the only way that we can all accomplish that hope and dream of a future that we hoped was there for us. And as we celebrate the incredible work of all before us, remember, we each have an obligation to set the stage for the next generation. It is our common calling. And that is why it is amazing that Dr. King Hammond has continued to leave a legacy of assisting the next generation of scholars and artists. She is the graduate award, the Hammond King Graduate Award was created in her honor at MICA providing funding for new and returning graduate students. That's an example of what I mean by a legacy. On a personal note, 
Dr. Leslie King Hammond served on CA's Board of Directors and then as CA's President from 1996 to 1998. She was CA's first and only person of color to serve as president. I repeat that. She was CA's first and only person to serve as president in this nearly 112-year-old organization. Without her work and dedication, I doubt that I'll be here today as CA is first person of color as the executive director and CEO. So you can understand my profound gratitude to Leslie. Leslie. Thank you. Wow. As the Yiddish say, I'm verklempt. <laughs> I am and have been wondering how I got to this point. And in the planning of this really very special moment in our history. I had to ask myself a lot of questions and do a lot of reflection. So first, I bring greetings to all of those of you who are here, us together. And I extend warm greetings to all of those in our virtual arena. In recognition of the anniversary of feminism, the College Art Association and the Women's Carcass for Art, I welcome you to reflect on this whole historic moment. I ask myself, how did I get here? Many of you might know me a little bit about me. And as one curator said when I went to introduce myself, she said, oh, your reputation precedes you. And I went, oh my god, what did I do? or should have done. It is my daunting task to address a perspective on the presence of the role of women in the visual arts during the last 50 years. And I will do it through my own formation as I went through my journey. I stand here before you as a woman a mother, a grandmother, a sister, a niece, a teacher, a scholar, a mentor, a friend, a girlfriend, a lover, a divorcee, a widow, a creative maker, and a community cultural activist. I was raised by a depression culture, great migration family, I stand here in the fullness of my blackness, of my Afro-Caribbean heritage, surviving those who tried to raise me as a proper young lady, while yet slamming doors in my face and trying to limit my opportunities. I am a child of the civil rights movement who was also concerned with one important question. How would I become a woman while my mother was really obsessed about me being this lady? I didn't see how the two could blend. But I wanted to be a woman of purpose and meaning, which has led me to this moment in my and our lives. As a child, my life was not especially easy or fun. The one constant in my life was my love and my passion for everything in the arts. Music, literature, poetry, you name it. I just couldn't get enough of it. 
I grew up in a family of makers and lovers of culture. The arts became my safe place, a sanctuary of protection, peace in a world so full of challenges for my young mind and spirit to fathom. My innocence was lost in elementary school after seeing the open casket image of Emmett Till on a lamppost while walking to school. His mother, Amy Till, was the warrior who made the world look, seal, and feel that horror, using the bold genre of photography to see the horrendous beating, torture, and death of her son, Emmett. I am still devastated to this day with the toxicity of such violence that is so rampant too often. I am now in middle school and required to read the diary of Anne Frank. Oh my God, just when I thought Emmett Till was enough to destroy my hopes, my aspirations, aspirations to become an adult. Here comes this thing called the Holocaust. What happened to the humanity, the empathy that my family was trying to instill in me as I'm looking at the world? So what did I do? Well, when I had those moments when I had parental mandate to time out or I was really fed up with the world, I would go to my room and under my bed, I had a little cigar box that my father gave me and I had all my stuff that I could make stuff. So I went there to my room, to this little box with scraps and corks and anything that I found, bones and nails and shells, and I would make stuff. I wanted to leave this planet especially after one day riding the bus to school, to college by this time, I dropped my art box and all my materials ran all over the bus. A lady gently bent down to help me pick up my brushes and put them back in my box. And as she did so, her sleeve rolled up where I witnessed a blue tattoo of numbers. I was stunned and she looked at my face, realizing that I knew what that tattoo was. And as she helped me finish it, we were both in tears. Again, I am still devastated to this day by that moment. A warrior woman I had witnessed who has survived the Holocaust that Anne Frank had talked about. I'm trying to figure out where my life is going. What am I going to do? I go to the library. I look for books on my heritage, my life, my gender, nothing. So I begin to read every book in the library on the shelf, starting with A, anthropology, archeology, span you name it, right up and down the line. All right. When I can't find it, they open up a little bookstore in the community and I go and I start to order books and I become fascinated with how you can tell the history of a people by digging in the earth from the very beginnings. So I cross all the disciplines. I don't know about categories. I don't care about categories. I'm trying to find out who I am in this world and what I'm doing. In the meantime, my family still wants me to be this proper young lady. You know, go to church, put on the hat, the gloves, and do all those right things, and I am hardly interested. My educational journey finds me in Buffalo, New York. Mm. Too much whiteness and too much snow <laughs> on both accounts. However, when I'm in Boston, I mean in Buffalo, I was blessed to meet the civil rights activist Fannie Lou Hamer in one of the public lectures. 
And I remember her vividly saying, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. She didn't need to say another word. In fact, I don't even remember what else she said, but I remember that. All right. I remember that vividly because that's where I was. I was sick and tired of being sick and tired of looking at how my life was having to deal with all of these hurdles, which I thought were just absolutely imbecilic, stupid, mean, toxic. Yet, later on that evening after the lecture, I end up in a Chinese restaurant with her. And I guess she felt sorry for me because I was a young college student and I was really skinny and she was feeding me. But at the same time, she was mentoring me. She was filling my head with all of the work that she was doing. And I was like, hmm, there is a method to the madness in this world. In the following year, I find myself in New York City because Buffalo is enough. No offense to the city, because they had great jazz. But I had to get on with my life, my way. And I started taking art and literature courses at the New School of Social Research. The professor had a wonderful reading list. And I loved that experience, being back in New York and being in that environment. The reading list was compelling. One week, you read the, one week you read the author, you get the author and you read the book, and then the next week the author walks through the door. In the third week of the class, who walks through the door but Betty Friedan? Whoa! Okay, so here I am, young, in the 60s, late 60s, and I'm reading Betty Friedan. I don't necessarily understand everything that's going on, except that I am feeling the flow. I am feeling exactly where she's going because this lady thing is out the wall and I am looking for how to be a woman in this world. Those of you who haven't read it in a while, the first paragraph, again, one of those telling phrases, she opens, recreating the scenario of a typical woman in her life, her full day with her children and the dogs and the cats and watching and then end up at the end of the day laying next to her husband. And in the dark, she says in this statement, is that all? Well, back to my family, because now they're looking at me as if I'm getting older and I should be looking at marriage not happening. I was blessed with a fellowship after my BFA at Queens College. Left New York to attend Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland. And lo and behold, who were my classmates? Arlene Raven and Lowry Stokes Sims. Okay? I am telling you my story because at this point in my research, I am tired of reading the narratives of other people talking about how, the, how people formulated their lives. And I want to know the stories, the narratives. How did you all, each one of you, we had wonderful presentations. We have filled up the shelves now with books and catalogs and exhibitions. What are your individual stories? Who were your members, mentors? Who were the sisterhoods that came and were formative in your life? So here we have the brilliant feminists, Arlene Raven and Lowry Stokes Sims, scholar, curator extraordinaire. The one thing that I remember at that moment was that the three of us, even as we went in different directions, and I ended up at Maryland Institute College of Art, and guess how I got there? Arlene Raven recommended my name. And so I moved into that position. But the three of us did not ever lose contact with each other. We would call, we would talk, and in the beginning it was not a very kosher relationship. We were like butting heads, but basically we were all about the same kind of work, 
but in the midst of defining our individualistic paths on how we were going to get there. And then as soon as we figured it out, we said, oh, wait a minute, we, we can't be button heads. We, we got a plot and plan. We have to figure out, as Lowry Sims says, how to create crimes of opportunity. Okay? How do we get it done? And until the moment that Arlene left us too soon, she called me and she said, Leslie, I'm not well. She said, please take over this show for me. And I said, okay. And I realized that's how we get it done. We have to pass the baton around and then pass it forward. I went on to become the Dean of Graduate Studies at the Maryland Institute College of Art. Oh my God, you should have seen the faculty when they announced that. There was the largest audible gasp of how in the room. And then there was one very, very vibrant profanity that echoed afterwards. And I went, oh, this is just going to be fun city. But you know what? I made a decision that it was their problem, not my problem, because I had not had a good experience in grad school at Johns Hopkins. And so having no experience at being a graduate dean, I used a negative experience to create a positive experience. As I continued in that job, one day the president comes to me and says, Leslie, how come we don't have any more students of color in the grad school? He thought I was a magnet, like people were just going to come and run and study with me. I said, you are not understanding the racial problem. The problem is not black or brown or white or yellow. I said, the problem is green. You can't come to school if you don't have money. Maryland Institute was a private art college, the oldest art college in the United States, 1826. I said, this is, this is like one of those privileged experiences where people would want to come, but they can't come unless they have resources. He said, okay. He said, I think I know some folks at you know, Ford Foundation. He said, do you think? I said, no, 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 no. You get the money. I know where the students are. I know where to find them. And you know where I came? The first city I came to after I knew I had that money? I came to Boston. I came to Boston. And I got my first set of students here. And then I went back to Baltimore where I lived, sitting on my front desk steps, watching artists walk up and down, walking their dogs. Okay. And one day I said to one of them, you've been complaining all the time about, you know, teaching public school and you don't want to do this and that. Tom Miller. I said, Tom, you know, I'm doing a lecture. Could you give me some slides? Because you know, back in the day we had slides before we all got digital and virtual. I said, give me some slides, okay? Because I, I need to present your work, all right, out in the public. Because people were not looking at the different kinds of imagery and artistry that was being produced from marginalized communities that were underrepresented. So he came by the next day, brought me some slides, and he's still walking around the neighborhood, you know, week after week. And one day he comes and he sits on the step next to me. He said, Leslie. I said, what? He said, um, I just got a letter the other day from the Maryland Institute College of Art. I was just accepted to a graduate program. I said, really? <laughs> How did that happen? I, I don't know. Okay. I paid his admission, you know, his application fee and got in there, and he was the first graduate student I ever had in over three decades of doing that job who sold out his entire thesis show. All right? That was just one of many examples. OK, let's get back to this talk, OK? By this time, because I am now um, being the national project director for the Ford, and then we grandfathered it into Philip Morris, for which I got a lot of grief for. Why are you taking tobacco money? I said, somebody's got to pay reparations, OK? Somebody has got to do something about corporations who are sending tobacco to countries to undermine the health and well-being. So we're going to take some of that money, and we're going to turn it around and make positive good out of it. So while I was doing all of that, do you understand? I was then becoming involved in the CAA because 
I had to get my artists out of MICA into the mainstream. So I would come to CAA, I would host receptions, and I opened up my receptions to everyone, every school. Most of the schools came and, you know, if it was Yale, you could only be a Yaley to go. If it was, you know, UPenn, you could only go there. But here I was, a little small art school, all right? And so I would tell my graduate students, I'd say, look, if you have an interview at CAA, you bring everybody that you met in the interview to our reception. And I did this year after year after year. CAA was critical. At the same time, I was becoming involved with the Women's Caucus for Art. And boy, I was pissed. You knew Judy, I was pissed. When you all used to have those award ceremonies at 7.30 in the morning, that really just annoyed me no end. And that was one of my goals. No, we belong on prime time. Do you understand? After Louise Bourgeois did not show up for that, that session where she got the award, I said, ah, no, no. This, we cannot have this. We are due respect. Eventually, I too got one of those lifetime awards. Thank you. Thank you. Always. Thank you. So here I am at the midst of this august moment looking at how we create new leadership. It is important that we really take a hard look at the times that we are living in. This is wonderful, all of the achievements that we have had. But I don't need to remind you that um, Roe versus Wade was taken away from us. Our reproductive rights are gone. We have a kind of decimation of our authority. And we now have to move into an area of activism, of a different level of work. So as I end my remarks, because we have so much to share later on, I want people to think about how do we get this work done? What do we have to do? I've been asked many times, am I a womanist? Am I a feminist? Am I an Afro-femme centrist? Um, I had to go back to the dictionary and really look up what was feminism. And feminism is really about the rights and opportunities of males and females. But in the past 50 years, we sort of because rightfully, we had a lot of work to do to get us visibly and in the roles in which we needed to be functioning and creating change. But my concern now is that my first feminist was my father. My father would talk to me as a teenager and tell me women have the power. It is through women's bodies that have the capacity to give life. It's through women's bodies that have the capacity to nurture life after it's born. We men are the seeds. We are the protectors. But you women have the power. And that power is terrifying. It is upsetting to the larger world. But we women need to get our act together. We need to reclaim our position. So I'm reading all the scholars. You know, where do we go? What do we do? Angela Davis, it's time to radicalize all of the isms, every last one of them. We have to rethink how we approach getting the job done. We have to do what I call can-do projects. What can we do right now? How do we reach out to younger scholars? How do we open doors? How do we make awareness? How many of us are ready to vote and how many of you have reached out into your communities to make sure everybody is ready to vote out all of those impotent individuals who represent leadership that are not committed to the goals of a whole humanity? We have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of work to do because we have not reached out to all of the girl dads. 
all of the fathers, all of the men. The other man that I remember vividly being a feminist was Pancho Mora, Elizabeth Catlett's husband. Oh my God. Powerful, clear, forceful, directed, supportive of her. Why aren't we aligned with those male groups? Because we need everybody in this fight to turn this around. This pandemic has put us on a plateau where what we ever knew before is gone. And now we have to create an entirely new platform. But we've got the skills. We've got the creativity. The arts are the foundational force. We have the capacity. We just have to figure out what can do projects do we create now so that we build another platform of generations of new leadership. It's not just about us. The next time this happens, there need to be more than two or three people of color in the room besides Mei Mei and I. And I love you, Mei Mei, for all of your wonderful statements. But we can do better. Lived across the street from Elijah Cummings, Senator, all right, Congressman. And he, I watched him come home every day, exhausted. My son would come in the house and say, Mom, Elijah had a bad day today. I said, how do you know? He said he got to the bar, block and he pulled his car in and we had parallel parking on one side and diagonal on the other. And he said he got to the middle of the street and just stopped the car, pulled out the key and went in the house. Not one neighbor ever complained, ever complained that he blocked traffic. We just went around it because during the time that we had our George Floyd, Freddie Gray moment, he would go from Congress to the streets doing the work, calming all of the youth as Joyce Scott, whose necklace I have to mention it, if not I can't go home, uh, was equally in the streets because she lived around the corner from the crisis. And so there are all kinds of ways that we can make difference. But we are the future of the 21st century. We are the mentors, we are the leaders, we all have batons. It is time for us to figure out where those new cohorts, collaboratives, posses, alignments are coming from so that we can keep this ball rolling and get back Roe versus Wade and every other right that we are entitled to. Thank you so much. What do I say after that? <laughs> Except to say, we are fortunate to have Leslie. I'm fortunate to have Leslie. CAA is fortunate to have had Leslie. And I am truly grateful that she's here with us tonight. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you. Well, Leslie's a tough act to follow. But I'll take home with me your charge we all, each and every one of us, here in person or watching virtually, have a responsibility. Not just by ourselves, but by those we bring along with us. Because it's not enough to stand up and be counted. It's not enough to say you are you and you are here. Because as fabulous as we are, as wonderful as it is to celebrate these 50 years of accomplishment, 50, there is still a whole lot to be done. And we cannot do it if we think we need to do it alone. We must bring 
someone with us. The only way we can succeed is if we do it as a collective. Every human being has a responsibility to make this place better than we found it. Male, female, or however you identify yourself. A scholar, an artist, a practitioner, however you self-identify. That is one of the beauties of CAA, actually. And that's one of the things that drew me to CAA. And so I'm going to take a few moments to share with you my vision and hope for the future of feminism at CAA. After all, the concept and cause of feminism is not abstract. From its inception, feminism was deeply rooted in the pragmatic. From the suffrage to economic autonomy and equality to the ongoing struggle for bodily autonomy. The fight for equity and social justice has been and remains at feminism's core. Within the context of CAA and the visual arts, feminists have pursued equal opportunities for and sustained presence of women as art practitioners, art historians, designers, curators, collectors, and so many, many, many others. Today, we've reflected on the achievements of women's early feminist pioneers. We must acknowledge and celebrate those on the vanguard of feminism at this organization on whose shoulders I stand. Thankfully, I can celebrate so many of you here today in person, for which I am eternally grateful. And the person and professional sacrifices made, the personal and professional sacrifices made to galvanize the role of women in the visual arts to the pioneers with us tonight. I would not be in a leadership position at CAA without you. For the first time in the organization's history, CAA, our executive committee today, is comprised entirely of women. The committee is one of the most diverse not just that it's of women, but one of the most diverse in a nearly 112 year history. Representing a range of artistic and academic disciplines, geographic locations and cultures. This executive committee also would not be here without you. So I thank you all for all you've done to ensure this place and presence of women and women identified people in the arts. Thank you. The future of feminism and the future of CAA will hinge not only on the continuation of this crucial work, but the reframing of this work with particular emphasis on equity, inclusion, fairness, social justice. The identification of feminists is a complicated one for many, both men and women, because each and every one of us, regardless of gender identification, as I said earlier, has got a role to play. Women across the globe, especially women of color, are often reticent to use this as a self-identification, despite a fervent belief in equal rights and opportunities for women, 
because traditionally, you see, we have felt excluded from the dialogue and later from the narrative of each wave of feminism. I can say that it is a lived experience. The same goes for access and representation, or lack thereof, in the art world and in academia. However, at this precarious moment for women in the United States and abroad, it's essential that we unite across race, ethnicity, and culture to embrace feminism and render it accessible to each and every one of us across the globe. In doing this, we must also acknowledge some of the current circumstances that challenge the progress that has been made over the past 50 years. The global pandemic has exposed many of the inequities still experienced daily by women, still experienced daily by immigrants, still experienced daily by queer individuals, basically all persons deemed as other by those in power. Colonialist aggression, the climate crisis, the spike of authoritarian rule, the backlash to social injustice, movements and compounding challenges to the positioning and progression of feminism. But I remain optimistic for the future. These examples demonstrate just how much work is still ahead of us, despite the incredible accomplishments that's been enumerated here today. Those joining us tonight, both in the room and via live stream, serve as a reminder that feminism is indeed a global cause. CAA has an expanding global constituency, and it is important to recognize that our members embody some of the most prominent leaders in the visual arts. Therefore, the actions we take and the conversations we hold or withhold within our organization will impact the field globally. It is essential that we understand, acknowledge, and above all, learn. For those of you who have read the strategic repositioning for CAA, there is a fifth fundamental, constant learning. We must learn from our past challenges as we forge a path forward. The leaders on CAA's executive committee, the wider board of directors, professional committees and members, staff and all of us understand and are humbled by this, using it to guide their work. And that was one of the reasons it was important to explicitly state that, continuous learning. I charge emerging leaders in the visual arts and at this organization to make their responsibility and the possibility it brings into your professional North Star. You are the future of CAA, and we need your time, your talent, your vision to steer this organization in the direction that is needed and must take to guide us into the future we all deserve. To our CAA members, we are here to serve you. But we need your help too. Inclusivity, accessibility, and responsiveness are paramount to our progress and ultimate success as an organization. And for the first time in our history, by virtue of the work we've done to renovate CA's membership structure and transform our digital infrastructure, members now have the ability 
to log into their MyCAA account and self-identify. While providing us with your demographic information is completely optional, collecting this from you enhances our ability to respond to your needs tenfold at least, and eventually provide a bespoke member journey to each and every one of you. Tailoring programs, initiatives, and membership benefits to your specific needs is our ultimate goal. And that is how it can be your CAA, my CAA, tailored to your journey. But we need your input to do so. As always, we love to hear from you. And you can contact us anytime, anywhere, how you prefer to do so. By phone, by email, and thanks to technology and our infrastructure any way you choose. However, providing your demographic information will be another leap forward in our endeavor to future-proof CAA service your needs, and help us to bolster equity and inclusion, not just for women or women-identified persons, but for all of our members and constituents globally. By both reflecting on the incredible achievements of our feminist pioneers tonight, and recognizing the need for expanded equity and inclusion moving forward, it is clear we have so much to be proud of as an organization, but also so much still to achieve. Earlier in this program, our distinguished scholar award recipient, Dr. Cecilia Fajardo Hill said, we need to open our eyes and embrace a broader idea of feminism that is diverse, that includes many voices, many bodies, many forms of art. She distilled perfectly my primary mission to increasingly intersectional feminist work at CAA for the next 50 years. To conclude this program, I want to reiterate thanks to those who made this event possible. I come from a culture that says you can never say thank you too much. I come from a culture that respects our elders. I come from a culture that greets with an embrace. Translated loosely means, I touch my heart to your heart. And it's with that in mind that I express my profound gratitude. Thank you to Boston University for hosting us, the first in this booth. I, I love saying that and the stunning facility, which from CAA we can only admire. And I cannot say thank you enough to the Booth Theater staff, especially Johnny and Ben, thank you. I thank you, say thank you to the Dean of the College of Fine Arts, Harvey Young, who oversees the theater complex the director of the School of Theater, Susan Mikey, and the director of the School of Visual Arts, Dana Clancy, for their support. Special thanks, I know she doesn't want to hear this, and each time she tells me I embarrass her when I say it. So live with it, Lynn. <laughs> I just want to say profound thank you. At deepest gratitude, my deepest thanks. Not just for making this facility available, but for embodying what service means. I am deeply grateful. And on behalf of all of us, including the board members who cannot be here to say thank you, and all of the constituencies we serve, accept our profound thanks. 
I thank Dr. Ann Sutherland Harris, my dear sister, friend, mentor, all around. Those of you who don't understand my language, one of several languages. Um, my chi is my sister Leslie, on whose shoulder I am proud to stand. And I promise you, I have accepted that baton. I know. You took the words right out of my mouth because I was going to say. <laughs> That's right. Because there is more work to be done. And it's not just her. So if I haven't mentioned your name, don't think you are off the hook because I'm coming. <laughs> Judy, you recall a little over a year ago when we had that first meeting going over what this would be like. I'm coming, <laughs> just so you expect me. And Jennifer, who in the last week Actually, I say in a week, it's not accurate. It's more how many days. At this point, we have become Siamese twins. But you know what, though? If you have a problem to solve, you make sure you put women in charge. And so we have a whole lot of work to do. But I'm deeply grateful that you are my partner as we do this. Thank you. And your mother's here tonight. I want to say thank you for giving me your precious daughter. And on behalf of all of CAA, thank you for being here as well. In your own right, as a woman that believes in the power of women and women identified people. Thank you to the CA Feminism 50 Honorary Committee, comprised mostly of feminist pioneers, for many months meeting, advice, input, donations. Without whom, we wouldn't have this event here today. Thank you to the CA Board of Directors for their support in issuing the board proclamation, a first in our history and making these out of cycle feminist, uh, feminism distinguish awards possible on this momentous occasion. It's not every year you celebrate 50 years of accomplishments. Thank you to each and every one of our partners. I thank our table who held a visual program with national and global reach in tandem with this celebration. Pen and Brush, who is hosting a satellite location party in New York City. Women and their work, who is hosting a satellite location uh, party in Austin. These key partnerships contributed to making this event first of its kind for CAA. And present here tonight is the first chair of the Development Committee of CAA, Katie Rogers. Thank you for not being scared away in creating this groundbreaking opportunity. <laughs> Thank you for being our partners to all of us uh, I've mentioned. And we look forward to innumerable fruitful collaborations with you in the future. Women's Caucus for Art and the Feminist Art Project have been in the trenches with CAA, working at the intersection of feminism and art for decades. WCA, as we heard from Dr. Ann Sutherland Harris and Jennifer, began the feminist work at this organization for which we'll be forever grateful. These organizations have tirelessly boosted the presence, work, and visibility of women in the arts. 
Thank you also to the next generation and emerging feminists who are carrying the feminism touch into the future. And thanks once again to the feminist pioneers for 50 years of sacrifice and support to ensure the place of women at CAA and beyond. And finally, I want to thank the dedicated staff of CAA and CAA members who have contributed time, money, and resources to make this event possible. But I cannot end this event without acknowledging and expressing my profound gratitude to Megan Donahue, my chief of staff, the first chief of staff in CA's history, the one woman juggernaut without whose energy, intellectual prowess, and all around best of everything, we wouldn't have this event today. Nobody could have pulled this off but Megan. And on a personal note, I want to thank, this is one of the times I can speak my language, except nobody will understand me um, in the audience saying it. But I'll say it anyway, mostly because it is the one that conveys what I really want to say. Obilu. Thank you. And so on behalf of CAA, I say thank you to all of you who have given so much by giving us a portion of your day watching this from around the globe and spending your time with us here today. It is people like you that make the future promising. It is your commitment that provides the hope that the best is yet to come. It is your support that makes me believe that we can do this. Thank you all very much. And now we can look forward to the next 50 years. Thank you.